Okay, looks like we're good. Okay. Yeah. 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 So Hi, guys. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. Um, I'm talking to Annie Phoenix today. And if you've watched um, Annie's interview, which is uh, live today, uh, you you will have you already have a good idea of what Annie's philosophy is about working with dogs. So if any of you have questions, just pop them into the Facebook comments and I'll, uh, you know, I'll get to them in a second. But Annie, welcome. Thank you so much for Thanks. joining me today. This Wonderful is to be here. I love the summit, but I'm a little mad at you because when you do something like this, I don't get anything done. Like, I'm sorry, I'm not seeing any clients. <laughs> I have to watch every single one. And then, and I, I say that so, I think some of us became dog trainers so that we would have an income stream to pay. Not that yours is you can watch it for free, but so we can pay to watch these other and just keep learning and learn. So it's blowing my mind. I love everyone. It, they, it's, it's yeah. very well done. Very well done. I know it's, it's, and I loved uh, doing the interviews after every interview, I was like, just, ah, oh, just <laughs> overwhelmed saying, Oh my gosh, these, so wonderful. So anyway, I'm so glad that so many people are really enjoying it and really getting a lot out of it because it is packed with so much wisdom from all of these amazing people that agreed to do these interviews. So I am very grateful for that. Um, so Annie, let's, let's talk about um, raising puppies. And uh, I know that we have talked about and you shared a story about the two dogs that you have now. They're, they're grown up dogs now, but you got them as very young puppies. They came from a, a really, really rough situation and they were just a mess when you got them. And uh, so, and I think that there's, there's a really uh, important message for anyone who's raising a puppy, whether you have a puppy that comes to you and is, you know, reasonably, you know, well adjusted, or whether you have a dog that you've rescued or adopted and there are some some concerns, there's some fundamental stuff that we can learn. So, um, yeah, Annie, just tell tell us, give us a little background okay. about where these two guys came from and what their story was. Um, they are half. Border Collie half healer, two of my very favorite breeds. And I know that because I did the DNA test and that's what I was told. And that, that part was factual. And their, their names are Finn and Cooper and they're full brothers. Their DNA revealed. So Cooper is a blue healer, looks like more, more like a traditional blue healer, has a thick uh, coat. He has a stocky body. They both thank God have their tails. Um, and he's like 68%, as I recall, blue healer. Finn, his brother, full brother, you know, I don't know if they were different dads, but I was told that there weren't um, mu much heavier uh, border collie. And he has a soft coat, a very, very soft lush coat. Um, he's I call him a white healer, but he's he's a red healer. Um, but he doesn't look like a traditional red healer to me. He looks like a white German shepherd. He has 10 percent shepherd in him. My other favorite breed. Um, so and they have the personalities of that go with those coats which is so interesting. interesting. Yeah. We call him our honey badger. Don't care. He's very, he's very sweet, but like, we are not this focus of his life. His life is his focus, which I love that about a lot of the cattle dogs. It's like, I got my own agenda here. I got, I got stuff to do. And Finn is very hyper-focused on us. He is a, he is watching where his sheep are. He wants to know what you're doing. He likes a routine. Um, he's much more nervous. Um, although both would make a great, working dog. And I think, and they were from working parents, but I think Finn would make them the serious working dog because his work ethic with a ball is like, I'm, I'm like, are you even having fun? You're so very serious about this. And then he's learned that we're going to remove the ball. So he doesn't want to give it back. So he'll, and he's found balls on walks and he'll just carry it all the way home. Um, so oh. we're kind of working with that. So, so it doesn't become an obsessive part of his life, but I got them after my beloved, um, and I say perfect. Um, I think all dogs are perfect, um, you know, in our perfect in the way that we love them and that they offer us love. Um, my border colleagues, Radar and Echo, that were also siblings, um, passed away at 
14. Um, and I said to my husband, I'm not going to get any more dogs. We're going to travel together instead of one of us staying home. And he's like, BS, when, when are we getting a dog? And I wanted puppies so that, and I was very nervous. And I said this in our chat, chat trying to find a resilient, well-bred, happy, not messed up dog. I didn't want a project and owners don't want projects either. They get projects. <laughs> Um, I wanted a dog to enjoy my life with that I was not constantly worried about it attacking people or dogs or neurotic or whatever you want to, whatever label you want to put on it. And I looked around, tried some rescues, um, and the, these rescues here in Utah were very honest. They were herding breed rescues and told me the issues that the dogs had. And, I'm, and they were adult dogs. And so I thought, I'm just going to look for puppies. And I got on, it's called KSL here, which is like Craigslist. It, and um that's a horrible mistake because I was just disgusted with how many dogs are for sale and how many are mixed breeds for $6,000. But I also kind of felt I knew I would, when I saw the dogs I wanted, I would know it. And here comes this adorable picture, which I can put afterwards of fluffy little tiny, they look really like Australian shepherds. Um, they were so fluffy, um, but they're healer border collies sitting on a bench and they all had J names. <laughs> And Finn was in the middle and he's white and fluffy. And I always wanted a white dog for some reason. And I always wanted a blue healer. So they were all, the rest were kind of blue healers. So I called the person and I, it was a veterinarian, which this is not a good veterinarian. And I love veterinarians and they have the hardest job ever. But this particular guy was old school. I never got to talk to him, talk to his wife. And I'm like, well, how old are they? They look really, really young. And she goes, they're five and a half weeks. And I said, why are they not? I never understood why they did that. I didn't get an answer, but I think it's the mentality, old school mentality of oh, their tough herding dogs. They don't need their mother. So they took them from Northern Idaho all the way to Southern Utah, which is, I saw them advertised. I got them at five and a half weeks. So they took them at five weeks, which is even worse. And they, the puppies have to stay with the mothers. To, I like nine to 10 weeks now, or even 12. Oh yeah, at like, least. Yeah, that teaches them uh, bite control and to not bite too hard and to back off and pain and body language that we absolutely cannot teach them. They have to learn some things from their other dog. And that generally comes from the mother dog if she's in a safe, secure place. And many of them are not. And I'm convinced that they then shoved them in the backyard because they had every kind of fleas. And oh, they had all both had fleas and, and two types of worms and very sick. And they had that big belly that they get when they have worms. Took them immediately to the vet. They threw up and puked in the car. Their eyes were just terrified. I mean, five, and they were this big. Yeah. And when we brought them into the vet, people would, people literally screamed when they saw them because they wanted to touch them because they were so little and cute, but they hadn't been touched. They had, they did not understand human touch. And I call them maligators. I mean, we were those par dog parents with our arms that covered because they would just redirect, redirect. I mean, they weren't trying to attack us. They just didn't know that petting was... Oh, yeah. Relaxing. Yeah. So I knew yeah. they had, that's a trauma, traumatic to be taken from the mother. They're car phobic, which we've been working on for three years and making progress. And I'm actually going to do a, a course on that about car phobia, because that's a big problem for a lot of people. And ginger snaps are alone, or dog medicine doesn't really resolve the issue. So, and I'm also doing a new course that'll be out soon um, on my website called the Joy Reclamation Project. And it's a 30 day step-by-step um, suggested path, like it's not rigid because the dogs are individuals. Um, how yeah. I helped these two brothers learn to be um, resilient, confident, and happy. I wanted them, to, I wanted to give them what was stolen from them by taking them as puppies that young. It's just cruel. It's so, and it's setting them up to fail. It's setting them up to be problematic dogs. I don't know what happened to the other ones. If they had all been there, these were the last two. I would have taken every single one of them and kept them for. 60 days or longer until I felt that they were safe. Finn would be a biter. Like he's like, he, he's clamped down on my hand once really, really hard and only once, but he like, he, he doesn't want to be dragged anywhere or told, you know, we, we ask him, could you please, like, we're going to vacuum now. He hates the vacuum. Could you please come into the bedroom? Well, he's figured that out. So yeah. he just stands there and you don't, if someone had grabbed him and took him by the collar, he would bite. He's like, I, this is not, and they're bred to bite cows. <laughs> so he's <laughs> never bitten, but he's made his choices very, very clear, particularly as his maturity is three and not neutered. The time he put his mouth on me is that he did what we did all the puppy stuff, touching their feet, nail trim, harnesses, all of it while they're trying to bite us <laughs> furiously for months. We were so exhausted. That's, that's one thing I want to say is that, 
my husband and I committed to these dogs um, and I used every behavioral knowledge skill that I've had over 25 years to help them get past that trauma because I knew how traumatizing it was. I knew what yeah. we were in for and we signed up for it and we took two. <laughs> I went to get Finn and my husband said, if there's a blue hero left, you're yeah. coming with two dogs and he, he knows me better than yeah. myself. So siblings, all of that. Yeah. The time Finn put his mouth on me was a year ago after he was um, mature, mature dog. Cause we, he did, we could trim their puppy nails fine. But when he matured, he said, no, do not touch my front feet. I do not care for this. So he made it very well known, not by biting me. I just knew body language. So I got him a scratch board. He loves the scratch board. So he, we have an agreement, negotiated settlement as Karen overall says, he scratches the front on the board. He loves to do it. He gets very excited. And then my husband holds his collar while feeding him peanut butter or something licky. And then I just get on the floor and do the back feet as fast as I can. The back feet, he's given me permission because some people, you can also train the scratch board and back feet. We didn't get that. So that's our agreement. The, the time he put his mouth on me, I thought it was so fascinating because a dog trainer would, right? Uh, just to kind of observe in the moment. Yeah, right. I was the ground, got the back feet, and I saw this one toe on the edge that he didn't get on the board. And it was really long. So I said, I'm down here. I'm just going to grab that foot and just get it so fast. He won't even notice. He noticed. Yeah. He pulled out of the collar, <laughs> put his mouth on me like this. And I felt his teeth. And I'm just sitting there looking like, his mouth is on me. He's, is he going to bite me? I wasn't scared. I wasn't mad. And I felt him release. And it's just a, that exquisite control where he said, do not do that. And I do not like it, but he did not hurt me. I thought I'd be bruised. Anyway, Finn would have bitten. He would not be long for this world because he's, he's not very trusting as, as a nature in his nature. Cooper is, was probably more of a family pet. He's way more laid back. But he likes things that he likes. And he also, they would, he would call him stubborn because he does his own agenda. Anyway, some of the things that we did to make sure that they were um, going to be well-adjusted and happy. And these are the happiest dogs I've ever lived with, ever. I did not focus on training. I didn't give a yeah. crap about training. Um, with a few exceptions, I trained a recall, um, a verbal recall. And we reinforced it because our, we're on a corner. And we have a wooden wire fence. And so um, if a truck goes by, especially um, like a lawn truck that's loud with a trailer, they hate it. And they can run up and down our fence yeah. line. That was becoming a big game and a thrill for them. So I'm like, we have to fix this. Amazon and UPS come right up to the door. Well, it's fenced off and gated, so they can't come to the door. But right by the garage, right by their gate. And as they matured, they got more hysterical because somebody was coming to the house, even though they love people. They love people. They love dogs. Um and that is on purpose as, as much as their genes would let them do that um, because that's what I wanted for. And that's what I focused on liking people, liking dogs, being well-adjusted, being happy, not being neurotic, not being scared. So we just worked around that and we fixed it when we know that the Amazon people are coming um, because they're pretty routine here. Sometimes they get caught. In fact, in the, this winter, we had so much snow here that um, our fence is five foot and the snow drift was four foot and oh, Cooper, wow. in his excitement, got on the snow drift when UPS came, jumped over the fence, which he's never done before or since. And the UPS guy was coming out of the truck instead of saying hi to the UPS guy, because they give him cookies. He ran into the truck because he knew how to open boxes. And he's like, What's, where's Chewy? I know Chewy's is in here for me. Um, and a different dog, healers can bite. They can be bitey. You know, he could have been protective and he wanted to see what was. <laughs> so what we did is, um, I said about not training others in the recall because that's life saving, and I want and they they have an excellent recall to this day, and that's also about the bond. I think a recall is very much about your bond. Does a dog want to come back to you? Um, I said I'm to that I'm not I don't care. I was burnt out. I was tired. I put a ton of titles, training titles, on my other dogs. I'm like I don't care a crap about that. I just want happy. I want well adjusted, considering what had happened to them, and I was just done with training. I'm just like not to say we didn't guide them. You know, you can't tear the trash up. You can't eat my couch, but it's my responsibility to give you other things to do and, and not provide those opportunities to be a bad dog. So I didn't give a crap about training. I'm trying to edit my cussing um, habit. Um, I cared about happiness and joy and resiliency. And that's what my new course is about is how to get back to that because that's missing. And training is one reason it's missing. We micromanage and we over, we tell yeah. dogs no constantly. Exactly. So I didn't right. worry about it. I didn't worry about, I wanted them to like dogs. 
because I did not want to walk a reactive dog on a leash and deal with that their whole life. And I wanted them to like people as much as their genes to talk. And I wanted them to not hurt each other because the biggest problem I had was besides them not liking petting. And luckily I got them. I think if they were any older, that might not have been able, I would not have been able to repair that. And I'll tell you what Finn does now because he's still a little conflicted about petting. Um, he's created a solution to it that's very unique. Well, it was not that unique, actually. Um, we just don't recognize it as being unique um, or what he's doing. So um, I um, concentrated on them. Oh, the biggest problem was them fighting. Like they um, just wouldn't back off. And I feel like the mother dog and the other siblings had to teach them that and they lacked that. And I couldn't, we separated, we separated, we separated, we re-diverted, we diverted. I did everything and all my skill set to say, please stop fighting. This isn't cool. But it just like, they had all that nervous energy and it just ramped them up and they wouldn't stop and they were going to hurt each other. And I said to my husband, I was so exhausted by this and them and their energy, their intense nervous energy. I said, I'm going to have to rehome one if I cannot convince them to back off of each other because um, they're cute and they're puppies. And it's fair, more fair to me to rehome them in a good home now than wait until they're a year or two old. And the fighting has got to stop. And so then I got the idea, and I wish more people would do this, to put on a local uh, neighborhood group. I'm a professional trainer. I've worked with puppies, dogs, 25 years, whatever. I would like safe, secure puppies that don't have aggression, have not been in a fight, um, to come to our yard that is fenced and safe and no parvo because they didn't have all their shots. And we will have controlled play dates that I will lead. And you can ask me any dog questions that you want before or after. I'm happy to help you. But I have to meet the dog first. I vetted every single puppy. Um, and I asked a ton of questions. And we had play dates from, I think, September. So I got them in August at five and a half weeks. So they were six and a half weeks or no, more than that, maybe seven or eight weeks. From that early age, safe, controlled play dates. I even put a X pin in the center of the yard. And if somebody got too riled up, usually mine, my two, <laughs> with each other. The other dogs are what taught them to back off. Mm -hmm. They learned that really fast yeah. from them. Not yeah. they couldn't get that. They they were too deprived um, yeah. from each other. So I would pick them up. I wasn't mad. I would just say, let's go into the center. And I had always had a juicy raw bone or something that novel to each dog. And I, w I wasn't punishing. I was just, let's take a breath here. You, you were just, yeah, just, just take a moment. And that's so important. Right. And so we did that twice a week, two different groups of dogs, um, and helping those dogs as well for the rest of their life until I think February, because COVID was, was coming in 2020. Um, and that made mm. all the difference in their lives. That, and it had to be safe because they were on a hair trigger. They were still, and when I look back at their photos, they're still not trusting me and Jeff and their environment until probably eight or nine months of age. It took that long to calm their nervous system down when you're hit with that big of a trauma. I mean, think about like an infant human being alone in a room, which is what they did to them and threw them in the backyard with no nurturing, no touching, not getting your needs met. That is you go to jail for that if you did it to a human. <laughs> to a child, sure. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. They, should, they should never have dogs again, these people. But yeah, um, it took us, I think about that a lot. It took us six to eight months to earn their trust, prove to them the world was safe through guided um, introductions to new things and new people and new dogs. Um, we had to earn it. We had to work really hard. And they were puppies. They are primed to want to trust because they have to, because they're so dependent on us or their mother. Um, and uh, they do trust us now completely. And they, they get along great. No fighting ever. They've never had a fight. I think they would have, they, and I would have had to rehome and maybe even been dog reactive if I had not had those puppy play dates. They were absolutely crucial. We didn't yes. crap about sit down, stay, none of it. We just wanted proper play that didn't get over the top. And if somebody did, which it's like the kids in kindergarten, you know? And the other thing that I learned from it too is naps. They, they were little terrorists and would bite us harder if they didn't get their naps. They were really cranky and agitated and on a hair trigger. So it's like kids, it's like little kids. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. Montessori school, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Take a nap. I right. want So yeah, I, I just want to Kind of stress a couple of points that you made that and i, I want to make sure people don't miss this because first of all 
taking siblings is a real challenge. And, you know, and, and the dogs already came with a lot of baggage because they had had such a difficult start in life. But even if that were not the case, taking siblings is a real challenge. You have to know what you're doing. And, you know, Annie had the experience and the expertise and the, the foresight to plan ahead and to make plans. But if you're raising siblings, you've got a really big challenge uh, in store for you. And also, um, one of the, the problems with these guys is that they were separated from their mother before they had an opportunity to really learn some of the fundamentals of how to be a normal dog. And they learn a lot from their mothers. And you know what Annie said earlier, like 10, 12 weeks, there's no reason why puppies have to leave at six or seven or eight weeks of age. Um, they get to be more difficult when you have, you know, six or seven at that age, that there's a lot more work involved. And that might be why a lot of people want to move them out into new homes at that time. But emotionally and psychologically, they, they very well may not be ready. And the time that they spend with their mother is invaluable. The things that they can learn from uh, from adult dogs and especially from the mother and even the father, if the father is there, um, it's just, it, it just can't be replaced by anything else. We can do a lot of like, like, and he had a lot of work to do to get these puppies to be trusting and calm their nervous systems down, you know, as she said. And that doesn't happen in a week or two. Like how long? Eight months, I think you said, like eight or nine months it took. So um, if you have a dog that's struggling with reactivity, don't expect that you're going to be able to just fix it in, you know, a couple of easy steps. It takes time. It takes patience. And sometimes you think you're making progress and then you feel like you've taken a setback and you've got to work it through again. So and that's just the way it is. So, um, yeah. And I, and I do have to say one other thing. Those puppy pictures of those puppies, pretty darn cute. <laughs> people, people would scream. And then I yeah. put their hands out because it, Finn looked like a little white polar bear. Uh, yeah. And Cooper, oh. Cooper looked like a little piggy because he had a little curly tail and, yeah. <laughs> and huge ears. Their ears were way too big for their little bodies, but they were uncomfortable with touch. And, and something about the mother dog, this whole conference summit that you've put on, which I'm such a fan of, we're talking about safety, create safety, create safety, create first and foremost, period. That's your job. Do that. And a lot of these problems, what I did is stop a lot of problems from ever showing up for these dogs. And it was hard. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I've questioned, why did I get to? Why am I so dumb? And I was willing to re, I went into it willing to rehome because I thought that that could be a problem. And it turned out to be a huge problem, which we worked on. And it took us that long. It took the other dogs. Anyway, the mother dog is the safety and the protector and the guide. We have a little um, Mama Robin that built a, a bird's nest in this big cedar tree that's outside of our, we have a big uh -huh. view of Utah uh, mountains. Uh -huh. and and a tree guy came that we use every year. And I said, could you turn that big cedar back because it's blocking some of our view. He stopped midway because he noticed a Robin was kind of dive bombing him. And he said, I bet there's a nest in there. And he cut one more branch and there was her nest very securely wedged in. But now we took her babies, uh, had that exposure from the wind and we've had tons of rainstorms. And I'm just like, oh, thank God he saved them. And we we're watching the babies, they all survived. But for two days, that mother sat on the nest after we removed that limb that protected her, because now her babies were visible to predators, is what I think. Mm, she just sat yeah, there. yeah, yeah, I know. I have a, a bluebird nest out kind of away from the house. Um, and there, there's baby bluebirds in the, in the nest now. And the, you know, I see the mother bluebird diving in and out, but I'm just hoping, fingers crossed, that when those little, hatchlings are ready to leave the nest that they're that they're safe because they will be kind of out in the open yeah and it's yeah and to see her sitting there like her eyes were wide and she just sat on them for two days and I think that was her response to I built this beautiful home and these stupid humans cut off and now here come the hawks and everything else and they have survived and I'm glad that the tree guy stopped we gave him a big tip for doing that because most of us just put take the tree down. It's in our way, not knowing. Yeah, yeah. 
And that taught me a lot about the weather is that she, she kind of helped them get through it. And they, they also didn't have protection from the wind and the rain that we've been having because uh, we took off a position. Anyhow, they, they lived. And that's yeah. what I about mother dogs, that they are that physical warmth. Um, Laura Donaldson, who I admire so much, and I'm always quoting, they learned. Hey, yeah. Oh, my guys. Whoops. All right, there's a little uh, interference there. I cut it off. Okay, go ahead. Talks about the rhythm of the heartbeat and how rhythm is so instilled in all of us. So if the mother is, her heart is beating faster or you remove the puppy so it can't feel the heartbeat, you have taken away every ounce of protection for that animal. And then maybe if you're a qualified professional, you can put some of that back into the dog. But mine were even thrown in the backyard. And... Mm -hmm. Uh, Cooper was going to be a resource guarder because the way he ate his food, you know, he was gobbling it. And I think they just mm -hmm. fend for themselves, you know, and Cooper's the runt, I'm convinced, and Finn's the biggest. And those come with different issues as well. Mm -hmm. um, Finn, so talking about pe petting them, you know, we it's just so hard not to pet and cuddle. So, and it's human nature and a mothering instinct because I know they didn't get that. They did not want that. They were squirmy, they were bitey. So I had to redirect that and get something to chew on and then slowly try to pet them. And they're still, to this day, Finn is, because he's very sensitive and very smart. He came up with this unique thing and Laura Donaldson's the one who pointed out to me what he was doing. He, um, if he, he comes and he sits and he goes, he just puts his head down and he looks sad. And he kind of goes like this, if you're gonna pet him. And of course he was never hit, but that early, he didn't get what he should have gotten when he was with a breeder. Um, is despite all of our efforts, he is not a dog. If he sits in front of you, he doesn't necessarily want to be petted. He's conflicted. Mm -hmm. So what he came up with, and I let him, is he put his foot feet on the kitchen counter. And my husband noticed it. And I, so I start petting him because his tail, he's like giving me consent and permission. You may pet me now. And he's grounding himself. Mm -hmm. He came up with that. And some, Laura says some people, some dogs jump on you. And this is why. And then we punish them. He has not stolen one thing from the counter ever. He doesn't even look around. He just said, I feel better. And in the mornings, my husband's, he's the one that trained them to be petted, to like it, because they sit out in their man, man chair in the man living room. And um, he had, usually has, Jeff has his um, feet on a coffee table. And so Finn jumps up every morning and his back feet are on the ground. And then he wants to be petted. Like he's, I'm ready to be pet now. I feel safe this way. He's a complete yeah. If he's not grounded, he's self-grounding. And I didn't recognize, yeah. I just knew he was happier. And so now we're, we have to think about being mad at that dog that jumps up and puts their paws on you. And what is the dog yeah. really going to achieve? Yeah, and it, it kind of reframes the idea of a dog that leans on you or a dog that is putting his paw and we kind of like, no, you know, get away, don't do that. Um, but they're asking for that connection that ground and that that was a big eye-opener for me too when I learned that from Laura and I'm looking at you know what my dog radar does now is he'll be running around playing outside and every once in a while he'll come running back to me and lean on me and then go off and play again you know when when you understand that there's so much that dogs do that we really haven't understood until recently. And once we start really understanding it, it, it just puts everything in a completely different light. So yeah, I, I love that whole concept of grounding. And it can be very sad. And I went through a grief process for when we finally go, oh, I, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have helped that owner. You know, people get shock mats for their counter. So when the dog goes, goes on the counter, they get shocked. And like, mm -hmm. So we are, uh, it's just, we do horrible things, yeah. but also just plain ass cruelty. And that's the hard part about being in this profession is that we, and, and we've done it. Like I probably would not have let him put his feet up there. Just why? Because we're worried he's going to take a steak knife or eat the chicken. He never <laughs> once has. Not yeah. one, that's not why he's doing it. Yeah. And he's a big leader. And Cooper is not. And I also have to, you also have to accept them for who they are, which is huge instead of our expectations. My only expectations was, please don't be neurotic. Please don't be reactive. Please don't hate, want to bite people. Please um, be happy. 
That's mm. different than walking a beautiful heel when I'm going down the street so other humans can see out what a great trainer, what control I have of you. They pull mm -hmm. us, they yank us, Finn is 70 pounds now. He is kind of a, like a small German shepherd. And um, I don't care. They're sniffing. They're enjoy they love their walks. Mm -hmm. It's not mm -hmm. as fun for us because we're stopping constantly and waiting for them. To, it's not exercise, really. We're just kind of strolling and letting them sniff. And yeah. if, if you get a new dog into your house, I would beg owners to say, how do I make this dog happy? How do I uh, make it resilient, help it become resilient? How do I d develop curiosity and play? Like mm -hmm. these dogs crack me up every single day. It might drive other people crazy, what the things that they do, but I think it's hysterical. They're just, he one day they... <laughs> So they have a dog door, which I love dog doors when they're, when you're home, our dogs are not out loud out if we're not home because that's safety. They fly in and out of that dog door hundred miles an hour and they go and check all the yard. Cooper barks at birds, of course. Um, and they love it. They just get so, they get so excited to come run in and run out, run in and run out. Um, but one day I got a new thing that I saw online that is a bedspread for like couches or whatever that the dog is not supposed to be tear. You can't tear it up. It's made for dogs. So I get it, and I put it on their dog bed and the next morning um, I come out and the, that thing is in the front yard and it's a pretty big, it's not like a king size, but I would say a twin, a, a full size bed or a twin bed, it's that big. It wasn't small. And I'm like, how in the hell did they get this through the dog door? And how did we not notice? Cause that took some, so what I, and I have this on film. So what I did is <laughs> put the blanket down. I went and got it from the yard and I put it down. I said, Finn, show me what you did. Cause he's the working mind where Cooper's does whatever Finn is doing. So F Cooper kind of misunderstood the assignment. Finn got it. You could see him and he started pulling it towards the dog door. And then Cooper was trying to jump on Finn. Like, this is fun. Let's wrestle. And Finn snapped at him. I mean, just like back off. He never, they never bite each other. My job here. <laughs> he told me to take this blanket outside and I yeah. filmed it. And then they started working together. Mm -hmm. pushing it through the dog door and then they took it to the front yard and ran around with it dragging it just so proud of themselves and I laughed and thought it was hysterical and then they shredded it to pieces which it was, wasn't was supposed to be so they've done it before uh, since then they've taken pillows out they've taken my shoes out I'm like I encouraged that I could not be mad I just wanted to see how they physically got the, <laughs> got the thing out so that's dog trainer nerddom yeah I know and you know I often think the difference between a dog trainer and somebody who's not a dog trainer is that when we're doing something that we know is going to have not such a great outcome, we know what we're doing. And, you know, we take responsibility for it. Um, whereas someone else might think, oh, how, how, you know, why is the dog doing that? Well, because, you know, you you helped him. <laughs> do it, so. um, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and I know I, I'm kind of with you, like my dogs like make me laugh all the time and uh, I don't, you know, fuss over paws on the counter. If I'm preparing food and somebody says, puts a pause, and says, hey, what are you doing up there? I just say, all right, not now, kids, just, you know, relax, <laughs> just get off. I'm busy. This is mine. Or um, if I happen to be standing at the counter eating something and the one little girl has has learned that to get a treat from me, all she has to do is get down like in that in that pounce position and I'll give her a treat. So I was like eating a snack. And so she's staring at me lying down and I'm saying, honey, this is my lunch. <laughs> no, you got to wait till later. And she goes, oh, all right. <laughs> I just realized that I cook a lot. And um, when I'm cooking, I have so many pictures of them. I call them my cooking assistants. When I'm actually cooking, they come in and lie down. Sometimes they're like right behind me and I'm going to trip over them. I'm like, you're trying, you have a death wish for me, but they just, they lie down, they watch. And I will, and if I put on black gloves for meat, because I give them raw meat, uh, raw beef in particular. Um, if I put on the black glove, they get up because they're like, ooh, now the black glove is the cue to get a piece of raw meat. I give them one piece each and they, they leave. They don't sit there and beg. Finn is not putting his feet up when I'm cooking or eating. It's only in the mornings or when he's kind of, I think he's kind of excited and he wants to be petted, but it's still that, I think it's the body keeps the score. He doesn't really know why he's conflicted because he didn't get it. If you don't get touch as an infant, it can become a very, very scary thing. There's like a window of opportunity to introduce touch or it's aversive and same for dogs. 
So yeah. I think his body says this, I don't know why, but touching me is kind of weird. So he says, I'm going to ground. And then he's happy. His tail's wet. Completely different dog. And to think yeah. he'd be punished for that just yeah. really is yeah. upsetting. So important to understand what their needs are. And if we simply recognize it and meet their needs, then then we just remove all that conflict. And, and as you said earlier, um, prevent the problems from happening by doing the right kind of preparation in the beginning. So uh, I'm excited to hear about, you know, to, to see that um, that 30 day plan when you get that worked out, that should be really, um, really useful, really helpful for a lot of people because it's that first month, a lot of times with a new dog or if it's a puppy or a rescue, people think, oh, I have to teach the dog this, this and this, the dog has to be, you know, well behaved and do all of these things. And the poor dog is still recovering from being separated from either from its mother and, and siblings or from whatever environment it had been in before and, you know, trying to get its bearings. And then we're putting all that additional pressure on them. So I just love that idea of giving them uh, time to, you know, kind of restore their nervous system and, and get focused and get relaxed so that they can focus on learning things gradually, not yeah. all of us. It's yeah. doing it all wrong. And the training industry is part of the reason they're, we're doing it wrong because we told them they had to do it. You have to walk your dog three times a day or whatever, instead of saying, build trust, build trust, build trust, because uh, like a shelter dog has probably had a home, maybe, maybe didn't, maybe it was a street dog, but had some stress. And then was in a shelter, enormously stressful, even if they do everything right. And shelter workers are my heroes. And I worked in rescue for many years. Um, then they're taken and it's loud and barking. And then they're taken to a new home that may have children and they may have never seen children before. And if the parent isn't right there constantly, you know, the children can just hurt the dog inadvertently or annoy the dog or the neighbors all come over. And it's let's, and just imagine those hands coming into you, particularly as a little puppy. Like I had to be pretty defensive with mine. We didn't go many places when mine were so little because they were too little. And um, COVID then hit when they were, you know, six months later. So that kind of helped a lot of dogs, I think, but then people went back to work and that's a whole nother problem. Um, but I, my whole course is, I'm calling it the Joy Reclamation Project. 30 days, let the dog learn its new surroundings. We demand so much of a dog, particularly a puppy. Like mm -hmm. the puppy is in shock. He's lost his siblings and his mother. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's just the way of the world. So instead of sit down, stay, and let's go to Home Depot and all these, and all this frenetic socialization, let's take a deep breath. Let's let the dog live and be a dog and do dog things while we're guiding. Like you said, your dog does the play bow. Um, she just learned that she self-taught it. Mom likes this. So I'm going to do it. And it's funny and it's cute. So she gets rewarded one way or the other, whether it's a smile or treat. Finn and Cooper taught themselves sit. I never asked for sit. Every now and then I'll just have a treat out. I give them cookies all the time for no reason. And every now and then they put themselves in a sit. Like, is this is what she likes? And Cooper added a paw. So he thinks sit is a paw up and it's so cute. And I just think it's adorable. And I reinforced it. I never asked him. They, they right. can I mean, sitting is is a natural thing for a dog to do. They can choose to do it on their own. There's no reason why we have to teach it. Um, and, you know, like you said, I, I have another puppy that just automatically sits in order to get a cookie. Now, I never told her to sit. She just does it and I give her a cookie. So that so <laughs> we work that out. Um, but yeah, there's there's so much of training that I think we have made so overcomplicated. And it doesn't have to be, it can be really simple and it doesn't have to be finished in six weeks or eight weeks or, you know, whatever the, the program is. And again, not, not to criticize those programs because they're important and they perform a great service, but I think we have to put everything kind of in perspective mm -hmm. and not put unnecessary pressure on these young dogs before they're ready to handle it mm -hmm. and cope. I think it's relief for owners to hear this. Most of my clients are like, thank you. They're, uh, some people even start crying. You mean I don't have to micromanage my dog? I can just exist? Co That's what we've done. We coexisted with these animals for 30 or 40,000 years. And then all of a sudden, because we're hierarchical, we've been in a patriarchal society, we have rules, sit down, shut up, and children shouldn't be 
seen or heard and women need to just take it, take the crap we give them and shut up about it. Um, okay. it, it trickled down to dogs and dogs for millennium adapted to us. Like street dogs are probably generally, I think, happier and more relaxed depending on where they are. I mean, if they're starving, that's a different matter. But in some of the, like Mexico and um, India street dogs, and I think Turkey has a bunch. Um, that's how most dogs in the world live near humans, but not captive in their house. So they make their own choices. And that is huge. We've taken away all their choice and then get mad at them when they do try to make a choice because it's the wrong human choice from our perspective. Um, so I also look for agency, like just having that dog door. You know, and that's when I, that's how I read apps is that I, well, first of all, we got crates and we crate trained them to be happy in there, but I don't use the crates anymore. That's when they were going at each other as puppies and I needed physical separation. I still have a, a X pin that I, you know, is open. It's not connected. And I put that across and I say, Finn, go to your room, which is an open living room. And Cooper's right there in the dining room. He goes under the table and they get their chew bones and separate because one chews faster than the other. Cooper is even kind of a little brat and he, he chews slower, but when he's done, Finn gobbles whatever it is down. And then he just lays down and waits. He doesn't whine or anything. Cooper goes over and just kind of throws the bone. It's like, he just plays with it, you know, cause he knows he's safe. And it's kind of a little brother thing. And, and Finn doesn't really care, but Cooper just can't, he's a little honey badger. He can't, he, he pokes the bear a little bit, but even to this day, we separate them to give them their own space. They don't, they sleep together. They sleep on the bed. They sleep where they want. Um, but I think that's important too, is to have a safe space where the dog can retreat when our human life is too much for them. Yeah. And, and that idea of, of giving siblings the opportunity to be by themselves is really a very important piece of raising uh, two siblings together. Because, it, you know, as I said earlier, there's a lot of challenges. I've done it many times um, back in the day when I was, uh, you know, actively breeding and showing, which I don't do anymore. But um, yeah, it's it's um, it it can be very challenging, and each individual has to have their own individual safe place, their own individual relationship. They they can become codependent on each other, and the dominant one can really overwhelm the less dominant one, and um, then you have a dog that feels um, that he doesn't have choices, and and that's not so good. Yeah, and. And if there is inner, inner house fighting among siblings or whatever, that's something you need a professional in fast. Like don't, don't let them keep practicing that. That's a, there are certain things that I think we still need trainers for uh, separation, anxiety, aggression, reactivity. Um, and, you know, inner house fighting, that's a terrifying way to live that you think the 24 hours a day, your body never gets to calm down. And I also just beg owners to just, we've told you, you have to train the dog. Now we're saying, well, hold on a minute. We're learning new things. How about we, that 30, give them 30 days. That's not too much to ask. 30 day investment mm -hmm. of in their system, showing them you're a trustworthy human being. You're not crazy. You're not going to harm them. And again, my dogs took till eight months to learn that. Um, spend the time building the bond and that and then they just flow with you everything is so much easier we're not trying to say sit 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 the dog starts sitting because you smiled and you're so they're so connected to you that they're like you don't even have to do a big emotion it's like you just our body or you exhale and the dog notices that and we have to be calm it all starts with us it really does and we're not calm we're neurotic species we're not a happy species right now um climate change and wars and everything um it's just a very aggressive society that we're in and i think we've always been kind of aggressive it's just that we had better ways to deal with it in the past like living outside <laughs> we're not outside anyway um so i i beg owners let's reframe this let's take a breath make sure you're good <laughs> You've worked out your trauma. You're not getting the dog to solve some hole in your life. You're getting a dog to be a good partner and to provide a win-win situation for the dog just as much as you. The dog isn't there, just like a spouse is not there to solve your problems or to, your spouse isn't required to make you happy. You have to do that first. And then you come to the situation fully formed and adult. And then you can provide that safe space. We have to start seeing ourselves as a safe space for dogs. And I don't think that's a priority. It hasn't been. No, no. It, it's as if we're, you know, the dog is there. But it has to be 
a mutual thing. And, and you know, as it's been reiterated, as you said, over and over and over again in the speaker's uh, presentations is that creating that safe space, that is the priority first and foremost. If you don't have that, if the dog doesn't feel safe, then nothing else you do is really gonna matter. So, yeah. Uh, we have a, a bunch of comments in the Facebook. I don't see any actual questions that people are asking you. They're just, you know, kind of cheering you on and, and um, agreeing <laughs> with, with what we're talking about. Um, so if anybody does have a question, they can pop it in there and hopefully I will see it and then we'll we'll talk about it. But we're, you know, we're approaching uh, the end of our, our hour. I know these times go so fast. Um, it, so Annie, if if you were to give advice, because I, I know there will be people watching this replay um, and we don't know what each individual person is looking for, but I, I assume that uh, anybody who's here and watching this really has um, a, a, a hunger for learning more about how to understand their dogs and how to give their dogs a better, happier life. So what if you were to give somebody like that um, your best piece of advice, what would you tell them? I would ask owners to reframe the relationship entirely from day one and see yourself not as a strict um, person who provides the discipline or the punishment, teaching right from wrong. See it more as a child coming into your life. We can say that now. We used to have our, we used to be hung for saying, treat it like a child. <laughs> uh, but I know. Most, yeah, we, we we're free to say that, or we are anyway. We don't care anymore. Um, that this is a sentient being that has its own needs and desires, and our goal, our job is to not make it look us look good walking down the street. That that's old goal. Our goal is to provide safety, security, comp, build confidence. And that means not introducing too much too quickly, slowing everything way down. Like that horse trainer who yelled at me on a new horse, do less faster. We're so busy mm -hmm. and we have busy lives. So let the dog breathe. Let the dog be a dog, have species appropriate. Dogs get a, a lot of stress relief by chewing and moving and sniffing. If you do mm -hmm. nothing else, move with the dog, even in your own house. It doesn't have to be outside if you have walking problems or if they have triggers um, and sniffing the world is huge. You can create sniffaris even around your apartment. If you're a lot of people live in apartments, um, hide treats and let them sniff that um, and play because you know, we have got to elevate play. It's just, that's when I know I'm making progress with a troubled dog is that first time um, that they play. And just really quick, I, I worked with a blue healer in Durango that was a rescue. I, I think of this when I think of play. Um, he was very protective of his owner. She was a very quiet person, lived just her and her dog, best friend. She walked him every day. And then she got a boyfriend. And, you know, they were 30-year-olds. And the boyfriend tried to make friends with the dog probably too hard. And he was, the dog was like, this is my mom. <laughs> you are not welcome here. And that can be a hurting dog, blue he or healer trait. You know, this, we have this thing and you're ruining it. Same with children when they come from a dog's perspective. And so he started growling and warning and then air snipping. And the guy just tried harder to get the dog to love him, which is a human instinct. So they came to me and um, the dog was in my training center in Durango and I wasn't going to touch that dog. He did not want to be me to touch him. And I had food and I had all, and I had the right body language. He, he was all about this one person. So I finally put my food up and said, does he play? What does he look like when he plays? She goes, oh my God, he loves tennis balls. And I should have asked that in hindsight in the beginning and been focused on play. So that's when I put my food up because it wasn't doing anything. It wasn't building, con food can be a conflict for some of these dogs and it was for him. It wasn't making my way into his heart. And I got a tennis ball out and I threw it and his body language completely changed. He was that puppy happy. Oh my God, a tennis ball. He brought it back to me. He let me put it in. By the end of it, I could stroke his back just to show her what's possible if the guy insists on petting him, which he, he, the dog didn't get anything out of it, but it wasn't growling that act of the tennis ball so we just changed the dog's routine he threw the tennis ball when he came home from work and guess what the dog uh, opened him into the circle of trust and that the man became his favorite person because the man was associated with the ball it's a little thing like that and again seeking play like why is this dog so serious 
why is it um, hypervigilant? What is causing the hypervigilance and how can I convince it that it's safe? I think is our number number one thing to do going forward with dogs. How can I convince yeah. them that it's safe? Yes, and, and uh, play is extremely powerful. And just a, <clears throat> a little preview for folks, tomorrow, uh, make sure you catch uh, Carolina Westland's uh, presentation. She talks about play and some of the things that she uh, talks about from, you know, from a scientific system, what play does. Totally uh, important. I, I agree that play is a, a critical thing. And a lot of times when you get a, a dog from a shelter or from a rescue, a dog that's had a lot of trauma in its life, they don't know how to play because they're too scared. Mm. And getting them over that fear and over that that feeling unsafe and that that they can't relax themselves enough to engage in play getting past that is a huge step so and it's yeah a lesson playing bit. yeah it's it's also um they mirror us and we're very serious we work really hard we got big bills to pay and things to buy <laughs> And so we don't play. And if we've been traumatized as children, which most of us have, um, many of us have, we have early traumas. If we're overly serious, that's a that's the, what a dog can do is say, life is about the tennis ball. It is not about all these other things that have way, that happened 20 years ago to us. I mean, it is because the body keeps a score, but I feel like play is such a huge part for humans as well. And then, then the whole relationship can break down with the dog because your one sense of play may be your walk. Which is not my idea of a play. A hike might be, but a walk yeah. is, you know, yeah. we even take walks seriously. We got to walk those three miles. You know, it's like if you have your dog reflect that you need to play as a human being and the dog is the one creature on earth that can can um, show you how to do that. And we've kind of stripped them of that. We're all so damn serious. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and and even, you know, even when they're out sniffing, um, I, I'm, I'm so over worrying about what they're putting in their mouths because, <laughs> you know, I mean, I, dogs are scavengers and, and sometimes we get so talk about micromanaging, you know, uh, a, a puppy picks up a leaf and it's like, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, he can eat that. And, you know, it might harm him. It's, it's only a leaf. Um, so, you know, the dog is eating grass, the dog is finding sticks or digging holes and finding things. That's all doggy stuff. That's normal doggy stuff. And we have to just kind of back off, chill out a little bit and let the dogs do the things that are just normal for them. Instead of punishing them for it. Yeah. And one of the things I know we're coming up at the end of the hour is that I wanted to thank you so much for the summit because I think it, what everyone is talking about is crucial and it's the future, hopefully the present, but certainly the future of where the industry is going as a whole. Thank God. I'm so grateful that it finally is. I think we're all kind of saying the same thing as professionals is safety, safety, safety and recovery from trauma, which dogs have trauma. But also, I just want to thank you because I'm a journalist. I don't know if you were a journalist, but you would have could have been a great journalist and a broadcast journalist. One of my options as a kid. Yeah, <laughs> I thought about it. Because interviewing people is a special skill that is the reason this summit is so powerful you could have the best people in the world, but if you're not a good interview host, honestly, people are going to tune out. So it's a teamwork that there's an ebb and a flow. And I've just enjoyed it so much. I feel very comfortable and I feel like I'm, I'm like, she must have journalism training because that's what I, my framework is, is and asking the right question at the right time is can save a life. And I think that's asking the right question of your dog. And it's why, why are you doing that? Why are you freaking out when you see X, Y, and Z, and how can I help you? I think it's crucial to ask the right yeah. question. Right time. Yeah. And you do yes. that. Yes, uh, thank you, Annie. Thank you for that, um, that compliment. I really appreciate that. Uh, but I also have to say um, that doing the interviews has been so enjoyable and so pleasurable for me. I am just like a sponge for getting all this information out of all of my wonderful guests that, you know, I try to think of, you know, what would people want to know about this? 
if I want to know it, then I think other people want to know it too. So um, just the, you know, the, the content of every one of the interviews has been just so fascinating to me and so enriching. I have just totally loved all of the conversations. So I, I guess that comes across that, that you know, so that's good. That's a good thing. So Okay, guys, they, yeah, thanks so much for joining us. I know we have some comments. I'll take one last quick look. I don't see um, uh, questions, you know, like, Annie, help me with this. So uh, everybody is just chiming in to um, say how much they appreciate and enjoy everything, you know, that we've been talking about. So that's a good thing. And I'll um, go in photos of my little when they were little, because they're, they're, I have so many, I'm bombing, bombing I know, people. I know, I know. You, were, um, you were spamming us with all those puppy photos. It was so much fun, I loved it. <laughs> okay, so um, thanks so much for joining us everybody. And we will see you again next time. I've got Holly coming up this afternoon. So make sure you hang around for that.